So I've had a lot of students say they're interested in stocks to me and want to study the stock market. Um, I personally am not rich enough to really be that interested in the stock market, but we're going to use this function modeling the price of a stock as an example of why these functions are useful to us. Um, so this is asking us to sketch a graph of the function, and then we have some questions about its features here down below. Um, sketch doesn't mean like you need point for point exactly how the graph should look, um, but it should capture the maximums, the minimums, and the key features, any zeros, so on and so forth. We're actually going to do this last. We're going to use our calculator to answer these questions down below, and that's going to give us a good sense of what this graph looks like, and then we'll sketch it last. So I've typed in my function exactly as I see it, checked all my signs, it's accurate. I'm going to hit graph, and I actually ran into an issue here when I hit graph. This was unplanned, but you guys maybe have run into this issue before. So my window is messed up, probably because I've been hitting the zoom button. To fix this, I'm going to hit zoom, and then the number 6, that's zoom standard, and that kind of resets it. So zoom 6 is going to give us a better idea of what the function should look like, and then that's a nice polynomial curve like we were expecting. Now, notice we want the stock price from January 2019 to August 2019. So we told you that x equals 0 is that January 2019. Now, August is the 8th month. January is the 1st month. So if January is x equals 0, August has to be x equals 7, not 8. And you can start at 0 and count February on your fingers, February. March, April, June, and so on, to double check if you don't believe me. So these are the x values we're interested in. We can actually adjust our calculator to show just these. All right, so on my window, I'm going to hit window, first of all, is the button. And then x min is the lowest x value it's going to show you. Let's go negative 1 so we can still see the y-axis x max is going to be the highest x value it's going to show you. So x equals 7 is the highest value we really care about. Let's go 8, just a little bit higher. We don't need to change the y values because we already got a nice picture of that graph. Uh, so I'm going to hit graph again, and then I get this. Actually, let's, let's adjust the y value too. So notice I don't need all this space down below. These are my y's that are negative. So I'm just going to go y min I'm going to go down to, and I'm going to adjust that to 0 instead of negative 10. All right, and look at that. Now I have a nice picture of the graph. Okay, My first question about the graph, again, we're going to come back to the sketch, is what are two times it would have been best to buy the stock? And the way the stock market works is you buy stocks at a low price, hoping the price is going to go up, and then you sell the stock when the price is high and you don't expect it to go up anymore. So two times it would have been best to buy the stock. This is really asking for the minimums of the graph. Okay, so I'm going to use that second calc menu to find the minimums here. So I can go second calc minimum and then left bound. Let's do, we're already over here, so let's do this right hand one first over here. And then right bound, I'm going to go to the right of that minimum and hit enter. And it's going to be a like guess, and I'm going to hit enter again. It looks like x equals 4. And notice it's not super precise. It's estimating. This actually means like 4, 1 is the correct point here. So we have minimums at x equals 4. So that would be, what, May in this case. And my other one, I'm going to do the same thing again. This time, though, my left bound is going to be way over here. And I get x equals 1 is my other minimum. So that would be February in our model. So if we buy the stock as cheaply as possible, we can maximize our profit. All right, and then a local maximum, we can do the same thing. And I'm not going to show that. My maximum, though, occurs at this point on the graph. And when I do second calc value max, I get 2.5 for that point. And that's about halfway through March, right? Now, what's the value of the stock in the middle of June? So this is asking us to plug in an x value. The middle of June is x equals 5.5 if January is 0. So I want f of 5.5. Now I can do this on my calculator as well. On that calc menu, we're going to use a new function. So I can go second calc value is the first one. So you just hit enter. 
and then I'm going to type 5.5. And that's going to give me the Y value, so 46 bucks. We'll round to 6 because it's going to be dollars and cents, right? And then increasing and decreasing intervals, those are going to be between the mins and the max, right? So I'm going to capture this left interval first as a decreasing interval. I'm going downhill. We'll say that's from 0 to x equals 1. And I did not say negative infinity because time can't be negative, right? And then we're increasing from x equals 1 to 2.5. And I know it's 2.5 because that was my max. And then we're decreasing again from 2.5 to 4 was my next minimum. And then we're increasing again from 4 to infinity. And then my last question is what happens to the graph as time continues to pass? So when well, we look at it, and the graph just seems to go up and up and up forever. This is called end behavior of the graph. And the way we can write this down is that as x approaches infinity, so x gets really, really big. This is a mathematical way of saying that with a little arrow. I can say f of x also approaches infinity. Okay. What that means, right, is that my stock price, based on the model, goes up forever. And I should hold that stock forever, right? It's a good value. All right, let's sketch the graph and let's capture what we have here. So here's my sketch. Uh, notice it's far from perfect, but I did make sure my scale was such that I use most of the graph. Um, and I did make points for my maximums and minimums that I found before. And then I try to make my graph go through them just so I can get a sense of what it looks like. Again, it's pretty ugly, so yours it's okay if yours is too. All right. We're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of end behavior before we move on. All right. So it turns out that the end behavior of a function is related to its degree. So any even degree function, such as a quadratic, sort of behaves like a quadratic. So notice both ends of the quadratic function go in the same direction. And the way we're going to write that down is by saying as x goes to infinity, so as x gets bigger and bigger in a positive direction, f of x goes to infinity. So that's saying this means x is getting bigger and bigger. This means the graph is going up and up forever. So that's the right-hand side of the graph. To describe the left-hand side of the graph, we say as x goes to negative infinity. So make sure you note that there's a negative there. As x goes to negative infinity is the way we say we're going to the left. And then we say again, f of x goes to infinity because it's going up and up and up forever. Okay. Now, if we slap a negative on this function, it flips the function, right? So it opens down instead. That's something you guys are familiar with. Um, then we still use positive infinity and negative infinity to describe the left and right hand side of the graph, right? So that's these guys. But now we say that each end of the graph, so f of x, goes to negative infinity. So that's how we describe the end behavior of this quadratic. We're only talking about it now so we can compare it to other functions because really it's not that interesting, right? It goes either up forever or down forever. Now a cubic function, so cubic is x to the third, so an odd degree function, well, their graphs look a little bit different. So notice now the end behavior of these graphs that I've drawn are not the same on either side, right? So either it's everywhere increasing if my coefficient is positive, or this graph is everywhere decreasing if my coefficient is negative. It's just like slope, right? So this one has positive slope everywhere. This one has negative slope everywhere. So we want to talk about the end behavior of the graph again. So I'm going to say for my top graph as x approaches infinity so that's the right hand side of the graph f of x also approaches infinity so that's how we say it's going up forever in the positive direction and on the other side i'm going to say as f of x approaches negative infinity so the left hand side of the graph I'm sorry as x approaches negative infinity f of x also approaches negative infinity so that's how we say the graph is going down forever and then if I slap a negative in front of it, these sides flip, as you can see in the graph. So the graph is a mirror image of the positive version. Then notice on the right-hand side, I'm going down forever. So f of x is now approaching 
negative infinity, and on the other side, f of x is approaching positive infinity because we're going up. Okay. Um, so this is, again, it's called the end behavior of the graph, and it depends on the degree of the exponent. And as we see, if you look through my examples down here and just label them even or odd, this relationship is consistent no matter how big that exponent gets. So here we have a, a seventh degree polynomial has the same end behavior as a third degree polynomial. Here we have a fourth degree polynomial has the same end behavior as our quadratic examples. So you're going to continue to develop that relationship in some practice problems here in a second. Here is your main idea. It is just that if you're interested in the end behavior of one of these graphs, you need to look at the term with the highest degree and then compare that to either a quadratic function or a cubic function.